Thank you so much, Professor Nakano. I really appreciate uh, to be here to make speech about fine Japanese relations. Yes, as Professor Nakano introduced, um, my back background is historian. My specialization is Chinese diplomatic history. Yes, uh, I, I was in Taipei for one year and a half, and I was in Beijing for one year and a half, and also I taught at Beijing and Taipei and others. Yeah, this, this was so challenging for me to teach Chinese history in Chinese to Chinese or Taiwan students, yeah. And actually, it is so much more easier for me to speak in Chinese to make speech. So that, um, it is, yes, it's my obligation to speak in English. Yes, uh, today's topic is so wide. Science Japanese relations of the past and the present. Uh, maybe I will talk about the 150 years history uh, of China and Japanese relations in one hour. It's so challenging. Yes, uh, as, as you know, uh, San Japanese relations, yes, uh, in the modern San Japanese relations, maybe we have the 100, uh, 150 years history. And um, now that we uh, open wider, the, uh, widen the, the period of history to the uh, 17th century, we can find uh, something about the uh, trend of population. Uh, Japan, Okay, this is the trend of the Japanese population. Uh, we know that the uh, population of Japan uh, increased, increased in 17th century and the latter part of the 19th century. Okay. However, China, the population, population of China increased in okay, 18th century. Yes. So the gap of development between Japan and China, Japanese, Japanese population increased 30 million in 17th century, and Chinese population reached 300 million in 18. Somebody said uh, 40, uh, 40, uh, 400, million, uh, 400 million in 18th century, Qianlong period. I'd like to say the, the gap of the increase, increase, uh, in, in, increase of the population between Japan and China. So after the 19th century, Japanese population re-increased rapidly and the late, late, sorry, 19th century. Uh, and yes, until late 20th century without the wartime. However, now, now Japanese population is decreasing, okay? China is also be facing with the population problem to be decreasing uh, in, the, in the near future. However, basically, Chinese population was increased after 90s, 90, 50 or 60 until now. So the, this gap influenced on so-called power balance or power transition. So 100 years ago, Japan reached Chinese G GDP. Okay, now that, yes, China take over Japanese GDP. So in 19th century, at the Edo period, Japan was not a tributary country of Qin Dynasty. And the China did, uh, Japan did have the trade relations with Nagasaki and through other ports, through Ryuchu, Okinawa, and other Matsumae, and others. So, from Qin Dynasty, the Qin, Qin people, Qin intellectuals, uh, did not have so many information about Japan without Teotomi Hideyoshi, Fengchen Shiuji's aggression toward Korea. However, Japan, Japan imported so many books from China and absorbed so many intellectual informations so much. Okay. And also, simultaneously, Japanese intellectuals like Motori Norinaga sought to be the independent of Chinese influence. Yes, maybe you know the uh, discussion about Karagokoro. Yeah, Motori Norinaga sought to be invite the Japanese identity and the Chinese identity then, in the period. 
And also, and, uh, in uh, 19th century, the result of the Opium War, yes, this is a great shock for Japanese intellectuals. Because Japanese intellectuals, the, the samurai, recognized Qin was a so great big country, big dynasty in East Asia. They, cannot understand, they could not understand why Qin dynasty was defeated by Britain. And such information was rapidly prevailed all over Japan, from Nagasaki to Edo and other areas. And Japan started to prepare the, uh, to protect coastal area of Japan from the attack of Western powers, Western fleets. And in uh, the treaty uh, the, the, in, in 1855, Japan decided open ports at Yokohama, Kobe, and other ports, maybe four, four or five ports, like Nanjing and the Tianjin Treaty in China. And also, uh, Japan needs local government or local staff at Nagasaki and Hakodate in Hokkaido sent envoys to Shanghai to open the trade between Japan and China. Edo government and the local staffs wanted to send envoys to, not envoy, uh, send envoys to the Shanghai to open the, open the trade relations between Japan and China. And also, Edo government expected to open the Consul General Office at Shanghai. Qin Dynasty accepted the required request from Edo period, Edo government. However, major, restora major restoration was happened in 1968. So the negotiation between Edo government and Qin Dynasty was finished in 1868. And afterwards, major government succeeded to the negotiation of the Edo government was Qin court. And in 1871, the treaty okay, between Japan and Qin dynasty was signed up. That was the first, first equal treaty for both Japan and China, Qin, okay? Yes, because the Qin, the, the treaties which Qin signed before it were unequal treaty, okay, in Nanjing Treaty and the Tianjin and the Beijing Treaties. Japan also. However, however, we check the archives of the negotiation between Japan and China in, 19, in 1871. It's so easy for you to find China got initiative to make negotiation. And also you can, the, you, you see, check the articles of the treaty, you may be you're surprised at some articles because one article decided that um, the exchanges between Qin and Japan will be done by the document in Chinese. It's so surprising. Yes, I, I, we know the samurai, yes, their ability to understand Chinese classics were higher than us, okay? However, if the, the documents in Chinese, who can, who could interpret correctly, or who had, which side had the priority, it's clear, it was clear, Chinese side. Chinese side, if Chinese side, yeah, said the meaning of the Chinese, this Chinese, Chinese letter, letters, uh, something. Japan had to hear, listen, the Qin Dynasty's official opinion. So basically, the treaty in 1871 was equal treaty. However, yes, in the detail, there are so many unequal contents. And the negotiation itself was not so equal. The Qin Dynasty grasps the uh, initiative. And also there are a little bit of misunderstanding about the Meiji Restoration. As you know, Chiang Kai-shek, he uh, taught at the 
uh, schools for the uh, military service or some soldiers at uh, Nanjing or Taipei, he yeah, strengthened the success of Meiji Restoration in Japan. However, in 1880s or 1890s, before the, the Sino Japanese War in 1894, most of Asian countries, including Japanese intellectuals, recognizes Meiji Restoration was not so successful. After the Japanese victory at Sino Japanese War in 1895 and the Russo Japanese War in 1905, the evaluation of Meiji Restoration was changed so much to be so positively. Okay. So, and also I, I, I hear the strength that the power balance between China and Japan in 1870s and the 1880s. As you know, in 1886 at Nagasaki, yes, there happened one big incident about the, the sailors, uh, no, Navy soldiers incident, of Ch Na Chinese Navy soldier incident in Nagasaki. Okay. I, I cannot uh, speak um, details about the incident because of the lack of time. Um, but uh, at that time, Chin's Okay, Bay Young fleets, so many big fleets yes, came into Nagasaki. And the Navy sailors yes, landed at Nagasaki and drank sake. And also, yes, violated Japanese people and the police. Yeah, that's a big incident. However, Japanese government did not do anything, did not do, do any eff efficient uh, resistance on the um, negative action toward Qin Dynasty. And the, the it passed those three or four days, Qin fleet left Nagasaki without any compensation. This is so shocking incident for Japanese people. But I have to say here, I like to say here, the Navy, power Navy in, of Japan was not stronger than that of Qin Dynasty in 1886. Yes. Maybe in the 1890s, the, the balance was changed, maybe. The, 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 a, a kind of question of, of the Japanese and Chinese history in 1880s and 1890s. Uh, as Professor Nakano in, introduced that, uh, I joined the joint studies between, about the history between Japan and China after 2006 to uh, 2010. Yes. Then, the, this topic, the power balance of the Navy and the Army in Meiji period before the in 1890s was a big topic, as we uh, discussed so many times, maybe, but uh, we, don't, we, do not, we do, did not get the concrete results. Yeah. Uh, yes. This one? And the uh, Qin military was much stronger than that uh, Japan's one, as I said. And Qin GDP was bigger than the Japan in 1880, uh, 1890s. Yes, in 1886, the Nagasaki Chinese Navy soldier incident happened. Then Japan could not cope with the incident uh, so efficiently, and Japanese public opinion was so sensitive to it. And also, um, I, I like to in indicate that uh, Japanese people in the 80s still admires, or maybe the first decade or the, the, the first uh, several decades in the 20th century, Japanese people still admired China, and most of Japanese hope to keep San Japanese friendship. Uh, such atmosphere uh, cultivated the early Asianism in the 1980s. So do you know He Ruzhang Huang Zunxian, then the, uh, some Chinese early diplomats in Japan, they had so many chances to talk with Japanese intellectual in, in writing Chinese character. Okay. And uh, there were so many archives about it. So some, 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 some scholars in China and Japan yeah, analyze, is, are analyzing the archives now. 
However, after the Sino-Japanese War, the relations with Japan and China was changed so much. It originally, the treaty in 1871 was basically a basic, basically equal treaty. However, the new treaty after the war in 1895 was changed to be the unequal treaty. So Japan got the same status with Western countries in China. So Japan joined the, uh, the power society in China. Okay, so Japan can be, a, could, uh, Japan tends to be the member of the a committee of ministers to China then, okay, especially after the Boxer Uprising in 1901. After the Japanese War, the relation, yes, uh, yeah, I got you. And also Japan, after the, after the Second Japanese War, Japan changed to be the colonial empire. Okay, because Japan got the Taiwan as a colony. So it was a great decision for Japan because uh, in Japanese government, uh, there were so many opinions about the Taiwan. Because uh, the, uh, some intellectuals and uh, officials said that because Japan was just building the nation, nation state. Japan did not have any power and money to reign Taiwan. So Japan had to sell, sell the Taiwan to France. France also expected. And also about the way to manage the Taiwan, there was two types of opinions. Some, some scholars and some officials uh, insisted that Japan studied, Japan learned the way of France to control Algeria. Somebody, the other way was the, the uh, types of the British rules toward Hong Kong. Afterwards, Japan adopted the Hong Kong way. So Japan separated the Japan proper uh, area and Taiwan area. So Japanese Meiji constitution was not covered with Taiwan. Japanese constitution of Meiji was not covered with Taiwan. It's so interesting. And also, uh, after 1895, China sought to be a uh, modern state like Meiji Japan, and so many Chinese students in, yes, came to Japan. Okay. So it's, it's interesting. Because the, the Second Japanese War, the first Chinese Japanese War in 1894 and 5, was not so called totally mobilized war, but not. So after the war, so the uh, uh, younger officials in China uh, sought to be uh, building the uh, modern state like Japan or Germany, which had the emperor. Okay. And also Japan, so many students came to Japan to study modern values, like the low economy and others. So and then Chinese students imported so many phrases okay, which Japanese interpreted from English and other Western languages, takes, like economy, jinji, or law, fa lu, or society, shou hui. Such words, phrases, were translated, trans, translated by Japanese from the English to Japanese. And also, for many Chinese people, yes, were not conscious that th these are the Japanese original words. Okay. But uh, I have to say that here, the, the Chinese students in Japan, they, their purpose of a study was just on the, the studying Western values and Western academics, not on the Japanese itself, Japan itself. So at universities, so many Chinese studies were eager to learn law, economy, and, uh, and uh, something. However, 
their views towards Japanese culture are not so respectable. They, Chinese students, observe Japanese lives, okay? Like a Japanese ate low eggs. Yes, Chinese students cannot, could not accept. And um, the, uh, the way to, to take a bath, such as so many Japanese lives, uh, the customs were criticized by Chinese. However, the one point was uh, surprised by Chinese people. This is the legs of female. Yeah. Uh, in, as you know, in Qing Dynasty, in China, the, the, the one customs yeah, was prevailed so strongly in Chinese higher ranked people. So uh, Chinese students in Japan, Tokyo, found that the uh, Japanese female legs were so healthy, okay, natural. So it is one big impact towards Chinese, Chinese students. There. So if you check the diaries of Chinese students like Song Zhaoren, So Kyojin diary, you can, you can find so many facts about that. At the Russo Japanese War, some Chinese officials supported Japan because they, they expected Japan could remove Russia from Manchuria. So it's amazing. Amazing. The, the, maybe the uh, the early half process of Russo Japanese War, so many Chinese intellectuals supported Japan. So, and also the, the, a lot of parts of the Russo Japanese War, like the, the officials at coastal areas of China, they reported some information about the Baltic fleets of the coastal area of China to the Japanese side. Okay. However, at the end, so many Chinese people found that Japan played the same role as Russia to control Manchuria. Yeah. Chinese people expected Japan to remove okay, Russia from Manchuria. However, Japan reoccupied Manchuria instead of Russia. So Chinese people were disappointed so much. This is one kind of, a kind of turning point to the relations between Japan and China on the modern state, on the modern society. In the first decade of the 10th century, intellectuals in China proceeded building Chinese identity and nationalism of China. As you know, in two, uh, 1901, Lian Qichao, Liu Keqiao, published one book named Guide of Chinese History. When the, he, Dan Qixiao, wrote the book, he argued one very interesting topic. He argued how to decide the name title of the book, what the title of the national history of our country. At that time, Zhongguo, the Middle Kingdom, this name was not so popular in China as the name of our country. So Lian Qichao discussed again and again and decided the title of this book to be Zhongguo Shi Xuren, the Guide of Middle Kingdom History. Yes. This is the, uh, the one case, one example on the process to make identity, identification, identity of Chinese or to build the Chinese nation. And also I, I'd like to say here that uh, in the first decade of 20th century, Japan is not, is not the, the main target, main target of the not Chinese nationalism because Japanese action, Japanese policy towards China, then, this is the first decade in, in the 20th century, was basically, basically same as that of other powers, like Britain and the United States and Germany, basically. So, in the first decade, is, is Japan is not the main target. Under the collective relations with powers in China, after the Boxer Rising in a 
to San Jojo, Japan basically kept cooperative relations with powers in China. However, the, after the Xinhai Revolution, after the world was first burned out, Japan sent troops Shandong with Britain. Though Japan and China was neutral to the World War I. Japan joined the World War I because of Anglo-Japanese alliance. And Japan attacked Germany's Navy base at the Shantung Peninsula. Is it, is it, is, was it legal or illegal? on the international law, the context of international law? I don't know. However, at that time, so many lawyers in Japan said it is not illegal. It is OK, no problem. Japanese lawyers said that. And after that, changes its basic policy and required 21 demands on January, January 18th, 1915. Japanese, Japanese policy was basically isolated among powers then. Because J Japan required uh, Japanese 21 demands. Okay? Among 21 demands, Britain and the uh, USA, they did not know maybe uh, five or six articles, demands. So Japan did not open all of demands among 21. So Japan did a kind of secret diplomacy to, to, with the, the uh, powers. So Britain and the uh, United States and the other powers were disappointed at Japan so much. And also, there's 21 demands influenced on Chinese nationalism. Because after the first decade of 20th century, Japanese, uh, Chinese nationalism was emerged. Okay? So, after the Chinese nationalism emerged so strongly, Japan required 21 demands. It was so stimulating to Chinese national nationalism. So anti-Japanese movement was emerging so strongly in 1915 and 16, and also in the May 4th movement, Wusu Yuntong. And it's interesting that as you know, so-called Tekisuk problem between Japan and China was happened in 1980s. Everybody says that. However, historians know, historians know, so-called history, not no history, Tekisuk problem was happened in 1910s. In 1914 and 15, sorry, 15, Japan criticized Chinese, some Chinese textbooks war anti-Japanese. So Japan required the Yuan Shikai government to revise such uh, textbooks. Yuan Shikai not was, they did not reject it. However, um, Yuan Shikai's answer is so interesting. Um, he said the, these textbooks were not official one. They were just side readers. It's no problem. This is Yuan Shikai. He, he is so I, I, I interesting and he is so wise man, I think. Yeah. And also in 1917, Japan, China joined. China also joined World of First and got the status of victorious country. So China, yes, can, could join the Paris Peace Conference. Republic of China recovered so many lost national rights, Sang Shida from Germany and Australia in in 1920s. Yes, as you know, China did not sign Versailles Treaty with Germany. However, however, in 1921, China signed up peace treaty with Germany. This treaty was Equal treaty, not unequal. And also, China signed up equal treaty with Australia in 1924. So, under the Beiyang government rule, China recovered 
many national rights which lost in Qin Dynasty. Okay. In the previous time, KMT's discourse criticized Beiyang government diplomacy. Okay. So recently, uh, Tan Qihua in Taipei and other scholars in the Chung, Chung, uh, mainland China uh, re-evaluated Beiyang government diplomacy or Qin Dynasty diplomacy more positively. Okay. So uh, through the uh, World War First, ROC China recovered so many national rights from Germany and Austria. But China uh, could not be successful to recover the national rights at Shandong okay, from Japan. However, in the Washington Conference in 1921, China was successful to recover the rights in Shantong and others without the uh, Japanese rights to, re to be released or the Guangdong Zhou is uh, the, 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 the Li Shun and uh, Dalian, okay? Because the, I don't know, as a loose, loose Japanese law, Japan got the right to control the, the uh, Li Shun and Dalian. Dairen Yojun from Russia, but the period of release, uh, of release was set for just 25 years. So in 20, not 20, 1923, Japan had to okay, return the right to control Dali and Ryushun to China because Russia got the right in 1898. Okay? It was passed 25 years from 1898. So in 1923, Japan had to return the right to the Ch China. But Japan extended the right to 1990 years, 99 years, at 21 demands. So Japan did not return this right until 1945. Yeah, so I, I, if I start to say such a diplomatic history, yeah, yes, that time is not uh, so enough. Yeah, and also uh, the May Force Movement was also a symbol of Chinese nationalism. In 1910s, Japan changed to be the sensitive existence of modern China. As Tan Jinhua illustrated, so many narratives about renewal demands and the peace conference were created. Yes, so 21 demands. So, so many Chinese, Chinese people believe in that. 21 demands are a treaty. Yeah, not. 21 demands was just demands. Yeah, that was not treaty. A after the Chinese government, the government accepted the demands on the uh, May 9th in 1915, uh, Japan and China signed up for treaties and many agree agreements at the end of the uh, end of the May in 1915. So 21 demands was not 21. As, as you know, uh, the the demands the, the number of demands which Yanshika accepted at May 9th were not 21 demands, 27 demands. Yes, it is so confusing. However, the 21 demands have changed to be the symbol of the Chinese Unicode Treaty, so everybody believed in that was the treaty. Anyway, in uh, the 1910s, the atmosphere was changed so much. And generally speaking, in 1920s, Japan's policy toward China was so modest uh, that the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Shidehara Kijiro, did not use the military power and adopted economic-oriented society uh, policy that was called Sidi Hara Diplomacy. But this explanation was illustrated, it, uh, still now, is still, still illustrated by Japanese scholars. However, Chinese scholars mostly recognize Sidi Hara's diplomacy as economic aggression. It's so interesting. Under the Washington, Washington system, which 
proposed by Professor Iri Akira at Harvard University. Yes, from the 1921 to 1931, in China and the Pacific, Japan kept a peace with USA and Britain. Okay, yeah, that's right. Japan kept a kind of balanced policy with USA and Britain. However, Chinese scholars, Chinese scholars now, did not accept such a concept. Chinese scholars now recognize Shidehara's diplomacy then as the economic aggression of the policy. It's interesting. It's a sort of kind of the, the difference of the uh, interpretation, uh, illustration of the history between Japan and China. In 1924, KMT government held the Central Conference at Guangzhou, at Chiangu Tanghui, and it started a military attack the northern government in 1926 called Beifa. Uh, on this purpose, KMT made a strong propaganda of revolutionary diplomacy, Gumi Wai Zhao, to recover lost national rights. Actually, actually, KMT was not so successfully did so-called revolutionary diplomacy. Yes, it's so difficult. It was so difficult for KMT government to abolish all of treaties okay, with Western countries. Okay. In the history, there were two countries, two, no, two new governments to abolish all of the treaties, which was signed up the previous government, Soviet Union and Turkey in 1920s. The, uh, the Soviet Union abolished all the treaties of Imperial Russia. Okay? And the new Turkey government in 1920s abolished all the treaties of Ottoman Empire. There are two cases. However, China, for China, it was so difficult. So KMT government also succeeded uh, to the all, most, most of the treaties which Qin Dynasty and the Beijing government of ROC signed up. However, on a propaganda level, KMT made strong propaganda that they proceeded, proceeded the so-called revolutionary diplomacy to recover all of lost territories and lost rights, national rights. And or, or the, their propaganda uh, showed that KMT will abolish all of the treaty which Qin and the Beijing government signed up including Manchuria, okay. So such a propaganda stimulated Japanese Guangdong army and others. In 1931, the Manchuria incident was happened as a statement this year that uh, as, yeah, to be introduced, this Manchuria incident was the turning point of Japanese modern history. After the Manchuria incident, Japan was against the mainstream and trend in the world, like anti-war and anti-colonialism. Yes, I introduce here one secret of the Advisory board of the Abe Statement, yes, we have the 16, 16 members. When we discussed about the turning point of Japanese modern history, 14 of 16 was, four, 40, 14 of 16 accepted the turning point in 1931 of Manchuria incident. Before Manchuria incident, Japan basically, basically uh, was, Japan was basically with the mainstream, mainstream of the international society. However, after 1931, Japan changed so much. Japan, uh, the not, Japan was not the collaborator. Japan was a destroyer of the national, international norm. So seven of eight members were not against this point. Two of 16 were against this point. One member insisted that the turning point was not 1931. Turning point was 
1937, or the burning out of the Sino Japanese War. The other, the most right rightist member, insisted that the, the, there, is, there was no turning point. <laughs> okay? Yes, so interesting. So maybe you, you can understand the, the, the atmosphere of Japanese ac academic or intellectual society. Yeah, and uh, for the uh, Manchuria instance, China did not uh, protect militarily, and uh, Chan Shui Liang also left the Manchuria to the northern part of Ch China. However, KMT government made war of diplomacy, war of this diplomacy at Geneva. Okay, there was League of Nations at Geneva, and, uh, and the other treaties like Nine Country Treaty. Uh, in 1921, and so on. And also, Litton envoys came to East Asia to investigate the situation about the Manchuria incident and other modern history in East Asia. However, on the process of the, the investigation of Litton Commission, Japan built the Manchu War in 1932. And finally, Japan left the League of Nations in 1933. However, we can uh, check the other fact that uh, uh, the League of Nations was a little bit different from the uh, United Nations. Okay. So the United, United States was not the member of the League of Nations. And sometimes the Soviet Union was not. And Germany sometimes in, sometimes out. Italy also. So the, uh, Japan, yes, built, uh, Japan left the League of Nations in 1933. Uh, this fact is so, so in important, but it is not the symbol of the Japanese isolation, okay? And in Tanku Agreement in 1933, China and Japan stopped the Manchuria incident, Manchuria incident. So Manchuria incident started in 1931, but that was stopped, ended in 1933. And also the, the Sino Japanese War burning out, burned, burned out in 1937. However, between the 1933 to 1937, the tension was enhanced, increased so strongly because Japan sent much more troops to northern China, Huawei, and set Huawei region, northern China, as the neutral region. Okay. That's so interesting. The number of troops, number of troops of Japanese army in 1937 were larger than that of in Boxer, Boxer Rising in 1901. Because why, as you know, why Japan can, Japan could send troops to northern, northern part of China? Because of the Xin Chou Tiao Yue, okay? Beijing Protocol, which signed up in 1901 after Boxer Rising to protect the legations in Beijing. So the number of Japanese troops at the northern part of China was larger than, in 1931 and 1937, was larger than the number of Japanese army in 1901. It's a so ridiculous case. So Japan sent too much armies in 1937. In 1937, Sino Japanese War happened. Japan sent troops coastal China and the region was Yangtze River. Chiang Kai-shek, yes, escaped to the Chongqing to resist Japan. Japan. And Chiang Kai-shek expected Sino Japanese War to be connected with the Western confrontation. It, it's so interesting that if you check the Chiang Kai-shek diary at Stanford, Hoover Institute, yes. After the so-called so the incident at the Markov Bridge, Lu Guo Chao Shi Jian, Chiang, Chiang himself, yes, did not recognize the incident as the start of Sino Japanese War. Maybe it was past the two or three weeks, the end of the of, of July of 1937, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, yes. Came to be came to recognize, yes, the 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 war, war would be uh, start, started. It is so interesting. So after the anniversary of starting point, 
of the, the Chinese Japanese war was set in July 7th, in 1937. So everybody believed the third point of the Chinese Japanese war was July 7th, in 1937. But however, then, Chan, Chan, Chan's diary and the other archives also indicate that the third point is not necessarily on the July 7th. Yeah, and after 1939, World War II happened, Chang, yes. After 1937, yes, World War II happened in Europe. However, the Pacific War was started in 1941. What happened in these two years from 1939 to 1941? Chan had expected to the connection of two wars. Yes, Chan had waited for Japanese attack to Britain or USA or Soviet Union. So two wars, Chinese Japanese War and World War II, were, was separated from 1932, 39 to 1941. However, Japanese aggression to French Indochina in 1940, it was a turning point. Okay. Because German troops occupied Germany. And in French, the pro-German government was found. So Japan recognized the French Indochina was also changed to be the pro-Germany area. However, however, the officials at, not Ho Chi Minh, Saigon, right? Officials in Saigon were not pro germany officials. The officials were sent by the other anti-Germany government. So the Japan sent troops occupied the northern part of the, the, the in China, okay? And also they, they are having so big problem. Why Japan occupied? French in China, because Japan wanted to stop what support from Western countries to Chiang Kai-shek in Sichuan province, because Britain and the United States used the road and the river from Hanoi to Kunming, yeah, in supporting to the Chiang Kai-shek. Okay. And also Japan, uh, in 1940, Japan uh, built the Wan Ching Wei government to control some areas and the management of the overseas Chinese. Yes, because of the time, lack of time, I skip it. And the, after the burning out of the Pacific War on December 8th, 1941, Chiang goes the change to join the allies, a uh, chance to join allies. United Nations, okay, China was recognized as the one of big four of the United Nations. This is a great change of Chinese diplomacy. Okay. China changed with one of the big four, Su Da Gu. This is a great uh, result of the Chinese diplomacy. So Chang was so excited at that day. Uh, the situation of the war was gradually changed in 1942. Then China got some chances to consider the plans of post-war Japan and East Asia, like Cairo Peace, Cairo Conference, okay? And also China itself started investigating the damage compensation includes Nanjing Massacre, Nanjing Massacre, okay? So China started the investigation, the Nanjing Massacre, in maybe 1942. In 1943, China joined the Cairo Conference and adopted Cairo Declaration that was the, one of the most basic and the important documents for the post-war East Asia, especially for China and Taiwan. And also China, as one of the four big powers, joined the project of preparation of UN, United Nations, at New York now, and got the seat of the member of the National Sec Security Council. In August 14, August not 15, August 14, Japan decided to accept Potsdam uh, Declaration 
And uh, in August 15, Japanese emperor opened this fact to the public. And Japan surrendered diploma, uh, officially in September 2nd at Tokyo Gulf. Okay. And after the Japanese surrender, USA held the initiative to, initiative to control the over and the design and the post of Japan. Yes, however, China could not be the main actor to Japanese colony, Japanese rule post, uh, after 1945. Uh, originally, Chiang Kai-shek plans to two big two groups of army to Japan to control Nagoya area. However, because of the burning out the, the civil war in China, Chiang Kai-shek gave it up to send troops to Japan. If Chiang Kai-shek sent troops to Japan, the history maybe will be changed, or Japanese film also changed so much. Through the Chinese civil war, USA changed its policy to Japan, started to strengthen economic support and weaken the disarmament in 1947-48. This is so interesting. In 1945-46, USA required Japan more democratic or more peaceful country, okay? And also the, the USA um, wanted to keep the Japanese economy a little lower, not so higher. However, under the uh, advancement of the civil war in China, on the formation of the Cold War in Europe, USA changed its policy toward Japan in 1947. So Dallas, Mr. Dallas came to, came to Japan and the, uh, the East Asian countries to, yes, declare to give up, give it up to require compensation on the penetration to Japan, and also studied the economic support towards Japan. And also USA, weakened the disarmament policy in Japan. So afterwards, Japan could have the self-defense army and navy. This is a big, big change. So in Japan now, there was two images of post-war USA's policy to Japan. The one is the left, left side Japanese thought, the more democratic, more peaceful, the other one is more realistic, okay? Economic growth and uh, yes, self defense, okay, no problem. There's so two, two ways, two images of USA's troops, uh, USA's occupation policy towards Japan. In, 1940, in 1951, under the process of Korean War, USA decided that Japan as a one country belonged to Western camp, Western camp, which was like the eastern, eastern part of East Asia signing up the peace treaty at San Francisco, and also Japan and USA signed up the security treaties. Japan, USA security treaties has two kinds. The first treaty was signed up in 1951 with San Francisco Peace Conference because the USA wanted to use the base, bases in Japan for Korean War. The treaty was revised in 1960 this is a new treaty, new security treaty, okay? Now that Japan strengthened, now the government strengthened the treaty, which signed up in 1960, okay? When the Prime Minister Kishi, who is the Prime Minister Abe's grandfather, signed up the treaty. In 1952, Japan selected ROC, not PRC, in Taiwan, to make peace treaty under the pressure of USA, dollars required Yoshida Shigeru so much. Chiang, Chiang Kai-shek and the KMT had a policy of division between original people and the part of military officers about the war, or that. Japan surrendered to China. China was the victorious country. How did China claim the responsibility of Japan for the war. Chiang Kai-shek said that most of people and soldiers in Japan 
or innocent. Yeah, small part of high-ranked officials and uh, military services had to be responsible for the war without emperor, without emperor. This is what Chiang Kai-shek thought. Chu Ming or Fen Lun. Okay. And also Chiang Kai-shek at the treaty abandoned to require reparation of the war. Chen strengthened his virtue, his virtue okay, uh, on the treaty to Japan, so-called Yi Yen. Then in 1950s, CCP also adopted similar policy about the responsibility of the war and approached to innocent people in Japan. So in 1950s and 60s, PLC in Beijing did not have formal relations with Japan. However, PLC and CCP supported Japanese people's some acti activities, okay, like anti-government movement on security policies and something. Okay. And also, the uh, Chinese side prompted to uh, make some um, activities of China, China, Japan, China Japanese friendship, something. Okay. And also, the main purpose of Chinese CCP's policy towards Japan was just on neutralization of Japan. What is the neutralization of Japan? Beijing government expected Japan cut off the U.S.-Japan alliance. Okay, changed to be a neutral country. However, in 1960s, Soviet-China split influence on Chinese foreign policy. China approached the, some Western countries, like France. France also changed the relation with France, uh, the Taiwan in 1964, uh, 1964. The normalization of relations between France and the PLC was done in 1964. Okay. Japan left movement, left side, left, leftist movement were also divided pro CCP and pro Moscow. It is the other story. In 1964, Japan successfully held the Tokyo Olympic, and in 1968, Japan became the second largest economic power in the world. Okay. And also, I, I, I hope you understand that. Um, in 1950 and 1960s, most of Japanese intellectuals were leftists. They love reading Marx and Engels textbooks. Maybe now they, you, you cannot understand and you cannot believe. However, my, my professors, teachers were not most of them, maybe all, all of them were the Marxist. Yeah, is, so they or their yes mind was set as the, the pro pro China or pro communism, pro socialism. It's so interesting. So in 1950s, 60s, so many leftist intellectuals in Japan discussed about the responsibility for the war and the strength and remorse and dependence about the war. However, unfortunately, unfortunately. In 1950s and 60s, it's, it was not so freely to exchange between Japan and mainland China. In 1950s, 60s, and 70s, so many Japanese leftist intellectuals discussed, discussed the remorse and the repentance about the war, about the responsibility, many times. However, they, cannot, they could not do any exchanges with Chinese intellectuals. Is so unlucky. Okay, and also the other point, and Ch China and the other countries were not democratized when such countries signed the peace treaty with Japan. In 1952, China uh, Japan signed up the peace treaty with ROC Taiwan, and in 1965, Japan made a treaty with South Korea to solve the problem of the colonial rule. However, at the time, Taiwan and South Korea was not democratic, were not democratic country. 
So at the time, on the decision-making process in South Korea and Taiwan, people did not join the decision-making process. This is the point. So after 1980s, Taiwan and the South Korea and the other countries were democratized. And the people required so many historical matters on the domestic context, okay? and also required to Japan. At the time, Japan is actually so you, is interesting. Japan said again and again, we solved such issues at the treaties in 1950 and 60s. Okay. This is the, uh, some gap between Japan and uh, the Asian countries. In 1962, it was the turning point of Chinese foreign policy that uh, China started to approach USA because of the military confrontation with Soviet Union at the Damansky Island at Manchuria and the Xinjiang province. And all is so unique. So in, in the Communist Party, Communist camp, the split between China and the uh, Soviet Union was getting stronger and stronger. China decided to approach with USA under the Cultural Revolution because Cultural Revolution started in 1966. How, how could Chinese government decide such a big yeah, decision is a kind of the qu a question. I, I hope the opening of the archives of PRC. Not in the maybe 50 years ago, 50 years later. In 1971, Henry Kissinger went to China, and the next year, in 1972, the President Nixon went to China. These were the symbols of China-America's China new diplomacy. Yes, the normalization between USA and uh, China was in 1979. However, this was a symbol. And also PLC got a seat of China represented in UN through the Albania proposal. So in 1971-72, the great change of Chinese diplomacy were emerged under the Cultural Revolution. And also change of UN situation influenced on Japan's attitude towards PLC. Because after the 1960s, Japanese government had one standard. If the seat of China representative of UN would be changed, Japan also would change, switch the recognition of China from Taiwan to mainland China. This was a policy. So Prime Minister Tanaka and the Minister of Foreign and the Affairs Ohira decided normalization with Beijing and visited China on September 1972, and also cut off the relation with Taiwan. But also it's so interesting, Japan successfully kept the economic and cultural relations with Taiwan after 1972. So Japan could change both of China, or China and Taiwan, to be the Japanese market. This is the one policy of Japanese uh, diplomacy. I think it's so interesting. And the joint communique of the government of Japan and the government of the People's Republic of China, PRC, China abandoned the right of requirement of liberation, and Japan side also declared that Japan understand and respect Taiwan was the essential part of PRC. United States Treaty with PLC in 1979 said that uh, understand, not understand, the treaty just wrote, acknowledge, acknowledge Taiwan was the essential part of the PLC. So this is a phrase, if you compare the phrase between treaties, as the treaties of the Sino-Japanese and the Sino-America, it is an interesting. And in the 1970s, in spite of US-China access, China Japan normalization, the security framework was not changed. Okay? So Japan recognizes the socialist country of PLC. Okay? And also Japan cut off the formal relations with Taiwan. However, the security boundaries at 38 lines of the Korean Peninsula and the Taiwan Strait 
was not, were not changed. So although Taiwan did not have formal relations with Japan, however, on the security issues, Taiwan was still allies with Japan and the USA. It's so interesting. And also in, in the, uh, and also uh, and, uh, uh, after the 1970s, South Korea and Singapore also recognized Taiwan, the Taiwanese government, as the central government of China. So normalization between Singapore and the PRC China was in 1990, maybe. And normalization between South Korea and China was in 1992. In 1978, PRC, PRC adopted new reform and open policy and the next year, 1972-79, Japan decided this policy, the, decided to support this policy through ODA, Official Development, Development Assistance, and other policies. After 1978, okay, when Japan signed up the peace treaty with PLC China, and in 1979, Japan started ODA, Official Development Aid, uh, sorry, assistance uh, towards China. Japan supported Chinese modernization. Yes. This is a so famous chart okay, of the Japanese feelings about China. This line, okay, the positive or friendship feeling of Japanese to China. This line shows the negative feeling of Japanese people toward China. When I was junior high school, high school students, eh? I had, and before, before that, in the 1970s, I had so many chances to go to the Ueno Zoo to see the panda, okay? And through TV, I usually watch the TV, TV drama or Silk Road or something. So many Japanese people loved China. Maybe 70 or 80% of Japanese people loved China. At present, maybe 80% of Japanese people have negative image about China. This changes so drastically. When is the turning point? When is the turning point? There was two turning points, I think. This, the first turning point is here, 1989. I don't know, Tiananmen Square incident. This, that was so shocking, so shocking incident for Japanese people. Yeah, as I said, most of intellectuals, most of the intellectuals were the leftist one. Yeah, they really believed PLA, let me see function, PLA was the tube for the people. It was impossible PLA to attack people at Tiananmen Square. Yeah, so, so many Japanese people were shocked so much. And also, as you know, a Gorbachev of a Soviet, Soviet Union, Soviet Union uh, sent to Beijing okay, to shook hands with Deng Xiaoping. Okay. It is a so epoch-making incident after the split of Soviet and China. So, so many in international media sent some groups to Beijing. So CNN, BBC, NHK, and other international media reported Tiananmen Square incident. So Japanese people watched the situation directly through NHK and other Western media. So, the, maybe the 15 or 20 points okay, were decreased of positive. And also negative points also increased media uh, 
15 or 17 points was increased after the incident of the negative image. Right. However, after the 1990s to this point, the trend continues okay, for 15 years from 1990 to 2005. Okay, positive as negative was a little the similar or same situation. Half of Japanese had a positive image of China, half the other half had a negative image. However, in 2008, yes, this is, uh, sorry, 2005, this was the turning point. What happened in 2008, 2005? Anti-Japanese movement in China. This movement changed the Japanese feeling so strongly. Actually, at that day, at that period, I was in Beijing and other areas in China. There, there were not so, so, so stimulating movement. Yes, I, I saw so many, a little bit, yeah, some students and some laborers to join the movement. However, I, I did, did not feel such a dangerous, okay, danger, dangerous. However, Japanese media strengthen the same cut again and again. Yeah. They fire some Japanese supermarket, a supermarket of Japanese company, and they destroy Japanese cars or something. So the media factor was so strong in 2005. After this point, oh, sorry. After this point, 2008, the situation was getting worse and worse. We can, yes, remember Prime Minister Koizumi. Do you remember Prime Minister Koizumi? Yes, he went to Yasukuni Shrine every year, again and again. Okay? Influence on the San Japan relations at the time. However, this is this Koizumi period. From the 2001 and 2006, yes, this. So the four years of Koizumi period and the final one year, the last one year was different. Before 2005, at Koizumi period, half of Japanese supported so-called friendship policy with China. So Koizumi at that time strengthened Yes, I am the pro-China. I love China, and something. Yes, at the time I think we think that this is a ridiculous, ridiculous phrase and ridiculous performance. However, yes, Koizumi knew half of Japanese supported the friendship with China. It's so interesting. So the situation at the Koizumi period and now was so different, so different. I hope you understand such as atmosphere in Japan. Okay. Now, 80% of Japanese people okay, had had negative image about China. So Prime Minister Abe and the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Japan uh, is uh, faced with such an atmosphere in Japan. Then why? Why, in this couple of years, Japanese government also has been eager to devise relations with PRC China, Xi Jinping government, right? Abe also is eager to see the, uh, the President Xi Jinping. Why? 80% Japanese, Japanese people has negative image of China. Okay, they, they, they keep distance with China. It's okay, no problem. However, Abe approaches China. And also Japan sent a message again and again to divide the relations. It is so interesting that we prepare two questions of the, on the poll to the public in Japan. The first question is negative or positive. Yes, 
80% of Japanese has a positive, negative image. That's right. And if I ask the Japanese the, on the second question, do you think that the relationship between Japan and China is, is the relationship between Japan and China important or not? 70% Japanese people answered, it's so important. It's so important. In China, to same question, 60% Chinese people answered, important. It's so interesting. In China also, maybe 80% or 90% Chinese people have negative image about Japan. The same. However, we ask Japanese Chinese, is relationship between Japan and China important? Most of them also important. I do not like he, him or her, but I think the relationship with him or her is important. Well, this is the real situation of the relationship between Japan and China at present. So Prime Minister Abe also kept a kind of the negative message to China. However, Abe's government also is eager to approach China, keep balance between such a feeling and a realistic feeling that the Japanese people recognizes China is an important existence, maybe on the economic relation, I think. So because a lot of time, I cannot explain all uh, the, some details after the 1980s. But you see the, this chart, you can understand the, the situation. And also, you check the turning point in 1989 and 2005. And also, you uh, see the, my PPT after the 1980s. Uh, you, you yeah, maybe understand the, the situation and the turning, the changes at 20, in 1989 and 90, sorry, 2005. Finally, I uh, will tell, talk about the historical issues. Yes, I really, really uh, appreciate uh, Prime Minister Wen Jiabao, his speech at Japanese Parliament at the, uh, on the April 12th, 2007. And then Prime Minister Wen Jiabao evaluated Japanese endeavor to deal with and about the historical issues like Murayama and the Koizumi statement. Wen Jiabao, Prime Minister Wen Jiabao indicated that um, Japan expresses so clearly to apologize and repentance. This message was so in, in, interesting and important to the Japanese government. So as the pro, uh, proposal documents about our board to the government uh, in, in, on July this year, I also wrote this part. I quoted the Prime Minister M. Wen Jiabao's speech. And also this was the, one of the uh, point of reconciliation between Japan and China. Yes, that's right. Japanese endeavor to the reconciliation is not enough, I know. However, uh, Wen Jiabao's message is so important to Japan and also maybe uh, Japan also still endeavor to continue to uh, be, um, yes, proceed, you know, to proceed the reconciliation with China and other Asian countries. Maybe you, um, everybody, everybody you see so many negative uh, articles on newspaper and others, but I hope you access the Japanese um, websites or Japanese newspapers articles in Japanese or in English. I hope you uh, collected so many materials Yes, um, I just hear one, one website, nippon.com, nippon.com. Yes, in English, in Fantiso Chinese, and Tiantiso Chinese, and Arabic, and Russian, and French, and the seven languages. Yes, there are so many articles, reports about Japanese politics, and um, 
economy and the society and the cultures. So if you see the nippon.com in the alphabet, you can understand the, the, the some, some um, graduation and some uh, diversity of Japanese opinion, Japanese uh, public opinion. So thank you so much. I, uh, my presentation is ending now. Thank you for so much for your coordinating attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kawashima. Well, his articles are also indicated. The link is available um, at the end of this handout, so uh, please check it out. Now, I'd like to open the floor for discussion. So please raise your hand if you have any question for Professor Kawashima. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kawashima. Uh, my name is Kwek Chinju. I'm the uh, assistant registrar from Nanyang Polytechnic. I came out of my own interest in this topic. Um, you mentioned something very interesting just now about the uh, 14 out of 16 advisors talking about the turning point uh, in the in, in a very early, early modern period of uh, Japanese and uh, Chinese history, hmm? where I think 14 out of 16 agreed that it was the Manchurian incident that was the turning point. I would like to seek your opinion about two other possible turning points before that. Uh, the first one being the first Sino-Japanese war, because after all, it is the after that war that uh, Japan has a foothold on the mainland Asia. That's one. The other one is uh, the one ten years later, uh, Russo-Japanese war, because it is uh, the one that gave uh, Japan access to Manchuria and especially the. Uh, the, the Southern Manchurian Railway, where the Guangdong Army uh, resided and uh, pre precipitated all the mm -hmm. other events that followed. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Yes, please. Uh, yes, here. That's right. There are so many turning points about sign Japanese relations. Yes. yes, I have to explain the situation. Yes, that's right. Uh, 14 of 16 members uh, was agreed that that was the turning point of Japanese policy to the world. Japan was against the mainstream, main trend in the world, anti-communism, anti-war. As you know, in 1928, as a Paris Treaty, most of countries' powers were agreed anti-war. And also the Britain and France adopted anti-colonialism. However, Japanese action on the 1931 was clearly against such a trend in the world. Yes, that's right. This is the first point. And after the announcement of the Abe and the publish of the Abe statement, the most ne negative reaction to the Abe statement was from South Korea. From a South Korean's point of view, the point was well, there's a Japanese occupation in 1910s. So for, yeah, the, from the South Korean point of view, the turning point was just, just, just uh, 1910 or 1905 through the use of the Japanese war when Japan yes, occupied Korea and um, um, yes, got the uh, Koreans' right to make diplomacy or derive it. So. From the Chinese history point of view, that's right. Uh, 1895, the first, and the loose Japan Japanese war, and 21 demands. Yes, over the uh, 1927 8, the Japanese invasion towards Shandong for Beifa. Yes, there are so many 20 points. However, the totally speaking, towards the world history or the world trend, uh, 1931 was uh, so clear. Uh, turning point. So if we propose the uh, 1905, uh, we cannot keep the 14 members. I don't know how many <laughs> members will be uh, uh, for our, our, our opinion, but uh, I understand and, and your, your opinion and comment. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to ask about the Yasukuni Shrine, mm -hmm. because uh, every time we read it in our readings, we always see that uh, China is always saying um, it glorifies the war, 
whereas for Japan, it's they saying that uh, it's to pay respects to the to those that have fallen in the war. Um, but I would like to ask if the sentiment on both sides is really so clear that. Um, I'd, so I would like to ask if there's any, for example, Japanese that think uh, we should not visit the shrine, or are there any Chinese that think it is perfectly acceptable for the Japanese to go and visit the shrine? And also, um, maybe, uh, what is the Japanese government's uh, thoughts on, on the issue? Like, how do you uh, discuss it? Yes. Uh, yes, so the, from the Japanese uh, rightist point of view, uh, the, the politicians visit Yasukuni Shrine, this problem was, is just a domestic problem. This is the view of the rightists, politicians, journalists. However, however, uh, so, so many of us, at least China and South Korea and other co countries do not like such activity. Yeah. So politicians have to be conscious of such uh, negative images, negative evaluation about this activity in Yaskun Shrine. So I, it is my personal opinion that the politicians um, have, to, have to be deliberate to uh, make such an uh, activity as a sh shrine. That's the first. Secondly, that uh, the, uh, in uh, the Koizumi period, in 2001, yes, after 2001, Koizumi went to visit Yaskuni Shrine many times. But Koizumi, I, I, I do not, I did not, and I do not agree Koizumi's action. However, from his point of view, Koizumi, he had a reason to visit Yaskuni Shrine. Because, as you know, veterans of the Japanese Army and Navy and the family of the wounded and the disease of the Japanese Navy and Army, Imperial troops, okay? Yes. They, that organization, they, they were the, the supportive member of LDP. So at the election of the top of LDP, Koizumi proposed if he want, would be the top of LDP, he will, would go to Yasukuni Shrine. This is a, a kind of promise. It was a promise was such an organization. So in order, in order to get the support, support from such organizations, Koizu visit Yasukuni Shrine, okay? This is the point. However, Abe and others, yes, who visit Yasukuni Shrine in this couple of years, or five or so, four, year, four years, maybe they, they, did, they, they did, not, did not have any reason to go to Yasukuni Shrine. Because the organization of the veterans or the wounded or the other families, this organization has been shrinked so strongly. They do not have any powers to the election in the LDP and others. So I don't know why, why the politicians visit Yasukuni Shrine now in this couple of years. It's the first. And I indicate here the other facts. Prime Minister Koizumi, the, he did not visit the Yasukuni Shrine before and after the period of his prime minister. Okay? So before his, uh, okay, you understand maybe. Prime Minister Abe is different. Ex except for the last visit on December in 2013, okay? Prime Minister Abe did not go to Yasukuni Shrine in the period of his prime minister. This is different, okay? So before his, the period of prime minister, Abe went to Yasukuni Shrine again and again. But maybe he retired the, the prime minister two years later, or three years later, he will go to Yasukuni Shrine again and again. Yes, so I, I, I hope you understand the difference between Abe and Koizumi. It's interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, another one, another one point. Yes, we understand the Chinese point of view. China recognizes A-class criminals, okay, were the, were the, the, the main people who, has, who have the responsibility for the war, okay? 
So the action of the prime minister and other politicians visits to Yasin Shrine, yes, expresses their agreement with a class, a class criminals who has the, who have the responsibility for the war. So Chinese side, yes, criticize Japanese politicians' activity and action. I understand. Thank you. Okay, my important uh, question to, to, to your intellectual is, uh, in spite of all the historical happenings, mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, what was written here, the, what touches me is to discuss a further future prospect of cooperation between China and Japan. <laughs> uh, I don't think you have touched on this yet. If you have time, can you touch on the future prospect of cooperation between China and Japan? Also, uh, I based on this because I recently read uh, Business Times yesterday, about Jetro uh, survey of the Japanese companies in China doing Japanese doing business in China for domestic or for export out of China, that uh, most of the Japanese uh, company feel that uh, the prospect of working uh, business with China is is very strong, in spite of the bad image the Japanese local uh, media gave to the Chinese, uh, you know, regarding the the, the military build up of China and also the uh, the Mr. Abe's uh, recent passing of the uh, the what the military uh, you know the SDF uh, the intervention I mean the they recently passed a parliament yesterday regarding the SDF role for global cooperation. So in spite of all these, the Jetro in China still have a good I I call that prospect for the business Japanese business in China. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do this actually help to move forward the cooperation between China and Japan mm -hmm. in your in your view? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Yes, yes, uh, because lack of time, I cannot exp uh, uh, express the uh, future yes possibility of cooperation between Jam Japan and China. Yes, uh, as I when I was in the uh, doctoral course. I study that the historian must not talk about the future. <laughs> However, yes, I have to answer this question. Yes, um, at the first, the, this, uh, okay, I introduced the trend of the population, yeah, from the early modern history. Yes, now that, yes, Chinese GDP is getting larger and larger, and maybe the, the amount of Chinese GDP is now second times yeah, uh, that of Japan. Yeah, that's right. Yes, although the per capita GDP is not so bigger in China, but in the 1920s and the 30s, Chinese GDP is getting much more larger than Japan. So power shift, power shift, from China, China, Japan to China or in East Asia is so clear, so clear. So Japan, uh, yes, Japan itself have so, has so many possibilities and um, uh, some selections in the future. However, Japan uh, must not adopt the such a strong policy or the hard policy, hard attitude toward China. Yes, this is the first point. So Japan had to keep an engagement and uh, some containment at USA as they and others. Uh, I introduce one example. Japan, Japanese government or Japanese parliament uh, this week, the new, the new law about the security issues yes, was passed or were passed at the parliament. And also Japanese government explored the, the new mission towards the PKO at South Sudan, South Sudan, okay? This is so interesting. Yeah, so, so many Japanese people criticize such activity of, of Japanese uh, self-defense at South Sudan, however. At South Sudan, what was the mission, new mission of Japanese self-defense army or as PKO, actually, Japanese self-defense will support Chinese army 
PLA, PLA Army at South Sudan. It's so interesting case. So maybe that's the East China Sea or South China Sea, Japan and the USA have, have, have a little bit sensitive relation with China. However, yes, on the global context, there are so many chances to make the cooperation, a co a cooperative relation with China and Japan, I think. Here's the one point. And second point, um, 15 years ago, 15 years ago, so many Japanese businessmen, a, a economists, alarmed Japanese people that Chinese expansion, uh, econ economic expansion was crisis of Japanese economy. Japanese, uh, Chinese exp expansion on the economy was the, the threat of, to Japanese economy. Yes, they allowed us again and again. However, it was five years. Yes, Japanese main partner of the, on, the, on trade changed to be China. And Japanese economy now relies on Chinese economy so clearly. And then now, now Japan accepted so many Chinese tourists okay, at Ginza and others. Chinese big bus, it was Chinese to come to Ginza and they bought so many, so many expensive bags <laughs> and medicines. Yes, and also so they, they bought something, some, some of the devices, a toilet. Yes, it's so interesting. So the atmosphere was in Japan was changed so much. In 15 years ago, everything our concern about China was threat. However, in this first 50 years, this half of us here was changed. On the economic level, on the economy, China is just a chance for Japanese economy. So that's now, what is the threat of the Japanese economy? The, the shrink of the Chinese economy. Change to be a new threat of the Japanese economy. It's interesting. So, and also about the AIIB, Japan did not join, or does not join the AIIB. However, Japanese government also said that, yes, in the future, it's possible for Japan to join it, okay? Because Japan uh, the, is the main actor in ADB, ADB, so, and the USA. So Japan and the USA and China make clear, make clear the demarcation between ADB and AIB. Yes, yes, after, yes, we make clear it, Japan can join the AIB. So there are so many chances, yes, However, there are a little bit uh, some confrontation and sensitive issues on the sea. So Japan and China and the USA and other countries have to set some frameworks and rules to sustain okay, the um, expansion of crisis as the sea on the air. And simultaneously, we can explore the points and opportunities to cooperate on the global level, like the case in Sudan, I think. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>